So uh, do be praying for, for her and uh, certainly for her health, but also for an opportunity for her to to learn God's way and to be turning to him. This is, is late in life for that kind of thing for her and then being in ICU is not a good thing, but uh, do be, be praying for her. And also for Sylvia, it's a stressful time for Sylvia to have one of her siblings in this kind of condition. All right. So the, the nature of our relationship to God is discussed in a variety of ways in Scripture. You'll remember that in Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. And uh, so he is the shepherd. John chapter 10 talks about you and I as being his sheep. In Malachi chapter 1 and at verse 6, God is identified there as the master, the master who should receive honor from those who serve him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4 and at verse 1, Paul refers to all the children of God, all those who are Christians, as the servants of Christ. He is the master, we are his servants. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and at verse 18, it says, I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And so there's that relationship of father and children. And then Isaiah chapter 64, uh, verse 8, it, it identifies God there as our father. But further to that, it also says that we are the clay and you are our potter. And there may be other relationships that are uh, identified in Scripture where God is this and we are this in relation to that. Uh, but for this morning, the, the fourth of these is what I want us to look at. I'm going to start over in Jeremiah chapter 18. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles there, uh, Jeremiah 18 and the first six verses present this idea of God being a potter and of his people being the clay. Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 1 beginning. He says, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The Lord used this local potter to teach Jeremiah about his role as humanity's potter. And in particular in this text, as it says, in verse 6, Israel, about his people of the Old Covenant. But of course, beyond that, he is humanity's potter, and, and we are all his clay. And even as the clay in this text needed to be remade or remolded, there are times when we need to be remade or remolded. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Three things. First of all, God as the potter, you and I as the clay, and then we can be remade by God. He can make us into what we need to be that we're so that we're pleasing him. Now, God being the potter, understand that he began by making Adam. He, he molded Adam and, and, and made him. Uh, we're told that he took of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And Adam was the crowning jewel of creation. You'll recall that as we're reading through Genesis chapter 1 and the days of creation, God made a number of things on day 1 through 5, and, and then day 6 there's the animals, and then man. And, and, and man was that crowning jewel. Uh, in, towards the end, I think it's Genesis 1 and at verse 31, it says God saw that everything that he had made and indeed, it was very good. Every day before that, the conclusion was it was good. 
And it was good. Everything that God makes is good. But on, on day six, when he was done day six, having made humanity, the last thing of, of all of his creation, it was very good. And I don't think that's just a, a summary statement of, well, the whole creation was very good. It's specifically because he's now made the crowning jewel of creation. This is what everything else was made for, humanity. This world is made for humanity. God made it as a place for, for Adam and Eve and for their descendants to walk upon and to live upon and, and, and eventually to, uh, you know, to, to leave and be with him in heaven now. But that's what made it very good. He was perfect. He was physically perfect. He was mentally perfect. He was spiritually perfect. He made him perfect. And at that point, Adam was exactly what God wants humanity to be. He had the freedom of will. He was a sinless, free agent, able to make his own decisions. But he was choosing, at that point at least, to serve God and to give honor to God. Now, not only is God the, the potter or the molder of Adam, but he is, in fact, the, the potter of all of us. He has made all of us. If you go ahead and uh, turn over to the Psalms, in Psalm 139, uh, David, as he writes here, tells us uh, in, in a beautiful way about God as our maker, in particular in verse 13 and following, but in the first part of the text, he, he talks about how God knows our, our sitting down and our rising up. He knows our thoughts. He, God, God knows us inside out. He, he knows everything there is to know about us. And, and he tells us in verse 13 why this is the case. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I, I am fearfully and wonderfully made Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was hid, not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me as uh, when as yet there were none of them. God's still the creator. Uh, he, he now uses procreation in order to affect that, but he's still the creator. Now, he didn't form you and I of, of the dust of the ground as he did for Adam, but he still has made us. In fact, Job acknowledges that. Job chapter 31 and at verse, uh, verse 15, Did not he who, ma uh, who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? God's still molding. He's still fashioning. Uh, Jeremiah, remember... When, when God speaks to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. God knows us. And, and as the psalmist says here, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Before we even are, God knows who we are. That is the, the power of our God. And so here he is as the, the potter of all humanity, of all people who would be born. He is the one who designed the human body inside and out. Uh, and so just as an artist, you, you know how some artists, they can they look at the, the white canvas, and all you and I see there is a white canvas. But in the artist's mind, they already see what's on the canvas before it's there. They know what it's going to look like. The sculptor, you and I, we see a a big chunk of wood or a big chunk of, of rock or marble or whatever it is that they're using. And that's all that you and I might see is just that big chunk. I don't see anything there. It's just, it has no form except that it's a, a big chunk of wood or whatever. They see what's in that. They see the form that is to be there. And that's how it is with, with God. God. God is able to look upon us before we're even formed and he knows our substance. He knows our being because he is the potter, he is the creator. And so because he is the potter and is the creator and is the creator of all mankind, he should be highly esteemed by his creation. We ought to exalt him. Go ahead and check over there in Isaiah chapter 29. Uh, Isaiah 29 and at verse 13 beginning. That's looking like a misprint to me maybe. 
Well, no, it isn't. I thought maybe I just grabbed the 13 through 16 from Psalms and put it down there as well. But no, that is the right text. Uh, Isaiah 29, verse 13, beginning, says, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught, uh, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Therefore, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder uh, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord and their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us and who knows us? Surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? For shall the thing made say to him who made it, he did not make me? Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? Realize who he's writing to. This is not Isaiah writing to a bunch of pagans and saying, y'all ought to acknowledge God. That's not it. Now, he did write about the pagans. You can back up in the, uh, a few chapters previous and, and you can see where he was writing about God's judgment against various nations. But here in chapter 29, he's dealing with Jerusalem. He's dealing with his own people. And of his own people, he says, you know, they, 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 they pretend to worship me. In, a, uh, in as much as these people draw near, near to me with their mouth and they honor with me with their lips, their hearts are far from me and they're teaching commandments of men. And, and, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a marvelous thing. I'm, I'm going to show the, the foolishness of their wise men. It will perish and their prudent men, their understanding will be hidden. And then he talks about how his people are treating him. Remember we said from Malachi chapter 1, that God is the master. And what Malachi reasons in Malachi chapter 1 is, if he is the master, then he should be honored by his servants. Same idea here. If he is the potter, then how dare the clay think it can hide something from him? The clay can't hide from the potter. The potter knows what he's doing with the clay. Uh, and yet they say, who sees us and who knows us? They forget about God. And further to that, down in, in verse 16, shall the potter be esteemed as the clay, which is greater? The piece of work that the artist has done or the artist who did it? The artist is always greater. Because that artist can do that piece of work and can redo it and can redo it and do a different piece of work as well. That piece of work is just what it is. And it can do no more. Now, shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? Shall we esteem God to be like us? No, that's right. We can't hide things from God. You can hide things from me. I can hide things from you. We can't hide things from God. God is able to see. Shall the thing that is made say of him who made it, he did not make me. What an arrogant piece of independence that is. You know, I, I, I disown the idea that God made me. Doesn't make it any, any different. God still made us. He has no understanding. I can hide things from him. None of that is, is true. Uh, but sadly, even among God's own people at times, they did not always exalt him and acknowledge him and honor him the way that they should. And, and so Isaiah here rebukes his people for not serving God as they ought to and not giving that kind of honor that they should. Um, you've got things backwards. God is the potter. God is the one who is in control. And so if God is the potter, then of course that means you and I are the clay. You and I are the clay. God made everything perfect. Uh, when he made Adam, he made Adam perfect. Uh, when he made you and I, he has made us perfect. There we go. It was just lagging behind. Uh, but the thing is, when he made us, it's a little different than when a potter makes a uh, a piece of pottery. They make the piece of pottery and then they're finished with it. They stick it in the kiln and it and it just, it is what it is at that point, right? It's not going to change. Well, human clay is not passive. 
human clay actually does something. You and I, when God made us, He made us so that we could make choices, so that we could do this, we could do that. Human clay doesn't get put into the kiln and then it's just set in stone. And so with that freedom of choice, which we have, the opportunity for corruption comes with it, to be soiled, to be broken. And as we saw in the text in Jeremiah chapter 18, Jeremiah goes down and he watches the potter. And and as the potter's working on this, this pot on the wheel, it gets marred in some way. Now understand that the potter did that. The clay didn't do that. God doesn't mar us. Uh, he's, he's not the potter in the same way as the flawed potter who, uh, potter who can, can mess up at the wheel. Uh, but there was this mar, there was this, this imperfection in the clay that, that started to show. The word that's used there in the, in the Hebrew, it's the Hebrew word shakoth. And it means to decay, to ruin, to be battered, to be cast off, corrupt, to be destroyed, lost, perished, spilled, or spoiled. Now, God doesn't cause the decay, but you and I do all of that to ourselves. When we choose to go a different route than God's route. Israel, when when Isaiah was writing to them here in Isaiah chapter 29 and rebuking them, remember he said that they try to honor me with their mouth and with their lips, and yet their hearts are far from me, and they're not doing my commands, they're doing the commandments of men. They had departed from him. Jeremiah lived in a day as as Isaiah did when God's people had marred themselves so badly he was bringing judgment upon them. Isaiah lived during the time when Assyria would come in upon Israel in the north. And then Jeremiah, not too long after that, was living in the time when Babylon would come in upon God's people in the south. And, And... that that's how badly marred they were, that they needed uh, to be removed and needed to be remolded again. But even in the Lord's church, there's this mix of good and and marred vessels or or people, uh, vessels that are honorable and those that are not. And, and we looked at this text, I think maybe a, a week or two ago in Second Timothy chapter uh, chapter two. But let's go ahead and look at it once more. Second Timothy two. And at verse 17, beginning, and he's talking about a couple of marred individuals right here in verse 17. Their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past and they have overthrown the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for honor and some are for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So he starts out in this text that we've read with Hymenaeus and Philetus. They're false teachers. They teach people things that are not scriptural. They destroy the faith of some. They are marred. And and in the process, what they do is they mar others as well. And and then in verse 20, that acknowledgement that in a house, there's all kinds of vessels. And that's true in the Lord's body, in the church as well. There's all kinds of vessels. There are are vessels of gold and silver and of of, uh, wood and clay, you know, different quality, if you will, in, in, in the vessels. But then not only the difference of quality, but also he says some are honorable vessels and then some are for dishonor. We talked about last week having a throw up pail or having a chamber pot. Those are the dishonorable things that we would have in our households. Well, we don't want to be the throw up pail of a chamber pot of the Lord's body. But unfortunately, that happens where some are are dishonorable. We just read about two of them. Hymenaeus and and, uh, Philetus. And there's others. They're dishonorable. They do not serve God. They're they're marred vessels. They're bad vessels, even though they're Christians. These two guys that he's writing about, it's not as though he's writing about a couple of fellows who, they're, they're not Christians. They are Christians. 
but they're evil. They've chosen to walk in a, a way that is, is not right. They've chosen to te teach people things that are not right. And so they destroy the faith of others in the process of, of doing that. Jesus spoke of there being both good and bad people inside the, the body of Christ. Um, over in, in Matthew chapter 13 and uh, verse 24 through verse 30, remember the we've got the parable of the wheat and the tares that, that he spoke about. And so the the, the field owner had, had went and sowed his field and he put good seed in his field. And yet when they got up in the morning after it had been growing for a while, there's tares showing up in the midst of it. Where did those come from? Well, the devil did that. The devil is wanting to, to corrupt the way of God's people. And so the, the, the devil will, will seek to make you and I go away places we ought not go and do things that we ought not do and say things we ought not say. We also have the parable of the dragnet. The, the net is dragged along the bottom of the, uh, of the, the river, or the lake, or whatever it be, and, and you pull the net out, and there's all kinds of things inside that net. You'll find some good fish in there, but you'll find that old boot that you don't want, and you toss that aside, and whatever else it be, right? And, and, and you know, his point is, and in both of those parables, and remember Matthew 13, these are the kingdom parables. This is about the, the kingdom of God. It's about the church. And he says there's good and there's bad inside of the body of Christ. We see the same thing over in Matthew chapter 20, uh, 25, first 13 verses. We've got the parable of the ten virgins. They're all identified as virgins in verse 1. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their, their, their vessels with their lamps, right? And, and so the whole picture is here are Christians. None of these are Christians in the world. You know, that would be comforting if we could interpret them that way. But that's not what they mean. These are all Christians, and yet he says in Matthew 25, five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. The foolish ones thought they could get away with not doing anything. They took no oil in their vessels with their lamps. And so out they go to meet the bridegroom. And Oh, hang on, we've got no oil. We can't light the way to go and meet him. And uh, those who had prepared themselves, they go in to, to feast with him. But understand that there's good and bad. There always is good and bad. We would love to think it's always good among the Lord's people and, and we ought to work towards that end. But the devil's there trying to draw us away and, and take us in a direction we ought not go. The Bible does command us to keep the church pure. And the Bible gives instruction about withdrawing fellowship from those who are not walking as they should, who are walking disorderly. But the fact is, sometimes we can be fooled. And sometimes we can be fooled long term. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is the one who's been credited with saying, you can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. We might be able to fool our brethren. And we might even be able to do so for a long, 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 long time. But we can't fool God. That was the point in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 16. They couldn't fool him. Oh, he has no understanding. Yeah, he does understand. He sees exactly what we do and he knows. Uh, and so, but back here in, in our text in 2 Timothy chapter 2, look back at verse 19 again. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, even though there is wickedness among God's people, Hymenius and Alexander in the context here, not Alexander, Hymenius and Philetus, in the context, verse 19, the, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. God knows. Whether you and I know or not about somebody, you know, we, we want to give the benefit of the doubt to people and we want to, to work together in order to, to build one another up in the faith. But in the end, God knows. The Lord knows those who are his. And then the second thing that he says, and this is for you and I, to make sure that we're his, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Hymenius and Philetus, you fellows need to stop teaching false doctrine and repent of that and start doing what's right. God wants us to depart from iniquity, to walk in his way. And so we're the clay and, and we need to be willing to be molded as God desires. He wants to mold us into the image of his son and so that we'll have his character, we'll be imitators of Christ. And so that brings us to the, the third point in our lesson this morning. And that's simply that we can be remade. 
Go back to, to Jeremiah 18, if you will. Jeremiah 18 and at verse 4. The vessel that he made of clay was marred in the, potter's, uh, in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. In Jeremiah's day, two verses later, verse 6, God wanted to remake his people. He addressed Israel can I not do with you as this potter? Again, during that time frame, Jeremiah is there in the time when the Babylonians are going to come in and start dragging them off, start, start uh, the, the exile to Babylon. But here's God saying before any of that starts to take place, can I not just refashion you? Won't you let me change you so that you're an honorable pot rather than the dishonorable pot. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. But what does the potter do with the piece of clay that just is so stubborn that he can't mold it? He'll have to toss it aside. And that's what God had to do for a time with, with even uh, Judah so that he could bring back a remnant from them. He didn't desire their destruction. He wanted their reformation. He wanted their renewal. That's the very purpose of the gospel message. That, that's, that's what Paul and Peter and others preached of when they taught about Jesus. Go over to 2 Corinthians 5. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, he talks about the the gospel, and about how it makes us new. Uh, he says in verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When someone becomes a Christian, the marred past is forgiven. It's gone. When someone becomes a Christian, the stain of sin is taken away. It's, it's removed. When we become a Christian, we are meet, remade. We're changed. The context here in 2 Corinthians 5, it goes on to speak about reconciliation. Uh, notice in, in verse 18 and following, Now all things are made of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that... God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Five times in those few verses, Reconcile, reconcile, reconcile. God wants to reconcile. But it can't happen unless we allow him to remake us. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The gospel, through the gospel, God as the potter is reforming and remaking and restoring and refashioning men and women so that they can be what he wants them to be. Now understand that this molding and fashioning doesn't end when we, when we become a Christian. That, that's when it starts. That's the beginning. Uh, that's the, you know, the renewal that, that we're told about in, in the, the New Testament. A couple of verses for us to go to over in Colossians chapter 3 to, to begin with. And, and keep in mind as we're reading this, he's writing to Christians about what needs to take place in their lives. In Colossians chapter 3, uh, we'll start back a little bit. Uh, verse, well, we'll start at verse 1. Uh, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting, sitting at the right hand of God. He's not questioning whether they're Christians or not. He's saying, since you were raised with Christ, since you become Christians, seek the things that, that are above, seek the things that are of God. And then he talks about some of the, the evil things, verse 5, that, uh, that 
we need to put to death, you know, get rid of fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Don't do that anymore. We, we've come away from that because of the gospel. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And then verse 12 and, and onward, he says, here's some things you got to put on. That's one of the great things about Paul and his writings. He'll never tell you to get rid of something without telling you what to put in its place. And so put on tender mercies and um, humility and kindness and, and meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, and so forth. But, but this renewal that he talks about here in verse 10, it's not a one-time deal. It's an ongoing process. We continually learn more about God and about his word and his way. And, and, and we change ourselves. We're renewed in our knowledge and grow in our faith. Romans chapter 12 and at verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The conforming is how we got marred and broken in the first place. We became just like everybody else doing all the things they're doing that are contrary to the will of God. He says, don't be conformed. That's a bad thing. We don't want to be like the rest of the world, but rather be transformed, be changed, be remade. And so if we're a Christian, then God has remade us and, and, and made us in the image of his son. And what he says there in, in Romans chapter 12 be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Got to change what's in the mind. Get rid of all that old junk that was there. Put God's word in there. And then we prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He's not saying that you and I are responsible for showing that God's word is, is good. God's word shows itself through us and, and, and demonstrates that, that God is good. Uh, and then Hebrews chapter 3. If you go ahead and open up there to Hebrews 3 and starting at verse 12. Uh, he uses the Exodus generation as an example in our text here. In Hebrews chapter 3 and at verse 12, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having, hard, uh, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Do not harden your hearts. What happens to clay when it's left to sit? It hardens. Do not harden your hearts. Let your heart remain pliable in the hands of God so that he can form it and continue to form it into what it ought to be. And, and, and he uses... Old Testament Israel, the Exodus generation, uh, as an illustration here, they come out of the land of Egypt and they were hard-hearted when they came out, complaining about everything along the way. And, and, and you know, God shows them his, his power and his glory over and over again, all the plagues that happened in Egypt and the distinction that he made between the Egyptians and them, takes them out to the to the Red Sea, parts the Red Sea so they walk through on dry land. After they come up on the other side, he gives them water and, and, and he gives them the manna and the quail and, and just everything that he does for them. And after all of that, they still say, it would have been better for us to have died in Egypt. Can you get any more hard-hearted than that? God brought them to the cusp of being in the promised land, 
And they're saying, we should have died in Egypt. And they want to rise up against Moses and kill him and, and find a new leader who leads them back to Egypt so they can go and die there. A foolish. But that's why the writer of Hebrews here says, look, they rebelled against God. He was angry with them for 40 years. Therefore, their corpses fell in the wilderness. And he said of them, you will not enter my rest. Verse 19 we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Not that they didn't believe in God. They did. They knew who God was. Their unbelief was disobedience. They were unwilling to obey what God said to do. They wanted to do things their way instead of God's way. And so their hardness of heart kept them from going. Now look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. There's still a promise of entering his rest. And when we get into chapter 4 of the book of Hebrews, the rest is no longer the land of Canaan. The rest is now heaven. There's a promise of entering his rest. Let's make sure that we don't fall short of it, that we don't enter into unbelief and disobedience as they did. I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make. You and I are the vessels. Let the potter make us how we ought to be. Now, we have a part in that. We need to, to listen to the potter. It's not that God's going to come down with his hands and, and literally change us into what we need to be. Here's how God is going to mold us into what we need to be. He gave us his word. And he wants us to be diligent students of it so that we find out what does God want me to be. And then when we find out that, oh, hang on, I'm not what I'm supposed to be, then we make the change. That is God molding us and recreating us into what we need to be. And so if we're willing to do that, then God will mold us. Again, verse 6 of that text, uh, as, as you know, we're to present ourselves as the clay in the potter's hand. He says, that's how you are to me, Israel. Well, they, wouldn't, they weren't willing. May you and I be willing to be fashioned and molded by God into what he wants us to be in the image of Christ. We can help you in your walk today. We want to do that. Maybe we can sit down and, and there might be some things that we need to be studying together. And we would love to do that. Uh, if there are things that we can be praying for, let us know what we should be praying for in order to, to help one another. Uh, we want to be molded and to be prepared for heaven. And God wants to mold us and prepare us for that. And so if we can help you, we want to do that. Maybe through obedience to the gospel. Maybe you've not become uh, a Christian. Uh, God's word tells us what we need to do.